Welcome to the 3 0 show, part of the Athletic Baseball Show. Derek Van Riper, you know, Saris Bricciaroli here with you. It is Thursday, March 17th, and it has been a busy week since we last spoke. The three of us, at least, the, you know, the lockout ended, and then the offseason started again, and we got three and a half months worth of news in the span of about a week now. And things keep happening. We're going to talk about some of the biggest improvers this offseason with the recent moves tacked on to previous moves. We'll talk about some changes in strategy and approach that we're already seeing as a result of some of the new terms of the CBA. And we may even get into some questions about defense and the impact of the universal DH time permitting. Let's start with that big question, though. The biggest improvers this offseason. You know, I know you... Took to the spreadsheet right away. <laughs> no, did the answer. Did you know check the numbers? That would never happen. So <laughs> I am very curious. So what you used for methodology and, and what you landed on? I'll throw up this a uh, beautiful, beautiful thing that I made. Oh my god! Look, oh, it's t- it's TV gold. If you're watching on YouTube now, you're seeing just the most beautiful uh, graphic ever made. It's just a spreadsheet. Uh, it has the team war totals on Fangraphs today. Uh, minus the team war totals on March 6th, thanks to the Wayback Machine and the difference. And the top five teams uh, that have changed their teams the most since March 6th are the Braves, who've added four wins, the Mariners, who added three wins, the Blue Jays, a little bit less at three, uh, Giants, uh, three wins, and the Yankees, just over 2.5 wins. So that's the, that, those are the winners, according to the numbers, the Braves, Mariners, Blue Jays, Giants, and Yankees have changed their teams the most since the lockout happened and we had that explosion of moves. And yet, I don't believe you. Uh, even though I'm the person who <laughs> believes in science and math and numbers, I'm, I'm into all that. I, I think it's important to pour through volumes of data and use numbers to quantify the, the things that are happening around us. Most of those teams didn't even make my list as I was going through the exercise of trying to pin down the most improved teams this offseason. Now, you were focusing really on what's happened since the lockout ended. I was thinking about it more from a, a bigger picture of the entire offseason. But I thought mm. the Twins, I thought the Twins did a lot, even just since the lockout ended, to make their team On this a list, lot the better. Twins lost wins. Yeah. That doesn't make That's- sense. That's why, like, these are <laughs> guesses by computers that are just, like, not factoring in the fact that, oh, the Yankees always project well because if they all stay healthy, they're going to be good. But we know that doesn't happen with this team, right? So, to me, there's a lot of holes in, like, projections, especially at this time of the year. Because mm-hmm. you look at teams, like, I was in Detroit earlier today in spring training. Talk about a team that overachieved, right? I mean, you take April out and they played over 500 baseball. Um, that's a team that I think is sneaky improved. And obviously they signed Andrew Chafin today, reliever. Um, he's kind of bounced around. He's been with the Cubs. He was with the Cubs when they won. Um, but I think they've made some really great moves that has made their team better. Adding Javi Baez, trading for Barnhart uh, to help really that young pitching staff to have a guy like that. Eduardo Rodriguez is going to kind of anchor that young staff. Um, I think the AL Central, maybe minus Cleveland, is like all trying to compete, which is – an interesting thing, right? Oh, like we had the, the Royals. Are, yeah. We had like, the Royals signing Granky today. Watch out. <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's very fascinating to look at, but I agree. I looked at that list and I was just like, I don't agree with this list at all. Um, it is, it is just since the lockout. And, and, and on the twins thing, I would just point out um, that I think that uh, even people who think the twins have done some good, would assume that there's like another shoe to drop. There's a piece by Aaron Gleeman saying you don't sell Josh Donaldson for this return unless there's another move coming. And so a lot of people have sort of assumed that that's kind of the landing point for maybe Trevor Trevor Story. And there, if that happens, then I could see saying that they were most improved because they kind of moved around money and they moved around people and they'll end up better in the end uh, with less uh, monetary requirements in you know in the future or at least fewer monetary requirements to someone like josh donaldson who's starting to break down so you know to more like a more athletic guy like trevor story so i could see that uh, just to defend the yankees for a second i think that they did have some awkward spots which is the fact that they were playing a third baseman at shortstop or a second baseman at shortstop um, and they didn't really have a shortstop so, you know, getting Isaiah Kiner-Falefa, I think that did show up in the spreadsheets, but also 
on their defensive end. Now with Donaldson, Isaiah Kiner for Leffa and Torres on the infield, that's a much better defensive outlook uh, than, you know, Urshela or Torres at short and trying to figure it out otherwise. So I do think that they did improve in like real life ways. You know, it's a, it's a little bit weird because they had to send Sanchez and now they have a total hole at catcher, but um, you know, maybe they're, they're trying things out a little bit differently because, you know, you know, they have been these big burly guys that strike out a lot and get hurt a lot. Now they've got, you know, a, a littler guy at short who doesn't strike out a lot and maybe he'll stay healthy. But they got another guy in Josh Donaldson who gets hurt a lot. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, I really don't like this move at all. I don't, I don't really care what the numbers say at all yeah. when it comes to this. I don't like it. I, I was in the AL East for a long time. I think Donaldson is a, is a guy who uh, isn't particularly well liked. I think if he's on your team, maybe it's a little bit better. But you saw Cashman called him a hated player. Uh, this is the GM who just acquired him. <laughs> his, so, ace, his ace hates him. So you do wonder if things go south, how that's going to function. I, I I just I was at the Yankees clubhouse two days ago, and I was kind of looking around and kind of wondering like, what is this clubhouse going to be like? Is it going to mesh? Is it going? Are they going to have this chemistry? Uh, because the last team that won in 2009, uh, I was around that team a lot too, and they had the chemistry. They had AJ Burnett and Nick Swisher and Sabathia, and they had guys who brought a lot of energy to that team and had a lot of fun. Burnett and was a really underrated guy for energy. He was amazing. He had this like WWE belt of his sons that he'd give every night to like the player of the game, and they went crazy over it. They like took it and ran with the whole idea. Mm. Swisher obviously is just like bro, 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 <laughs> like just a hundred, a hundred percent of. He, the time. he probably rubbed me the wrong way if I was in there, but I think I could. He's kind of a player's player. Yes, if, if you're winning, it works, right? And so I, I look at the Yankees clubhouse, and if they're winning, okay, this may work. Josh Donaldson, you know, he had the bringer of rain and the umbrella and the whole shtick. Um, right. I think if he's winning, if they're winning, it works. But I wonder if they go through a rough month or two, how that clubhouse handles it, right? Like, it, to me, they're just it's a fascinating mix of, of people in there. It's what I was thinking when I was there um, two days ago. Like, who's the leader and- here? What what I think that's interesting too about what you said about how the Tigers work. It's like if the Tigers are going to be better than the projections, it's because these guys are going to come up. Riley Green is going to come up and be great, or uh, you know Spencer Torkelson is going to come up and be great. And you don't project guys to be great right out the bat. You just project them to be you know maybe slightly better than average or whatever. You always regress a guy until they show you that they're great, right? Um, and so you know their depth. They're young guys that are coming up. They supplemented with older guys that are on the on the major league roster, and now they're going to have these young guys come up, and it might just gel. And that's how good teams are born, right? The it's kind of like the Manny Machado signing in, in San Diego. It's like you you buy an older vet or two, you get them in place, and then these young guys come up around them. Um, that the opposite's going to maybe happen in Atlanta, where they sent fifty million dollars worth of prospects now. That's a that's a weird number because that's really subjective because it's it's based on like you know this person valued this scout valued them at this and so this is this is worth this much so so for the Braves maybe they say wow you know Kristen Pache we don't think he's actually a, you know like a major league regular so we can trade him you know uh, but maybe the A's are saying oh that's that's worth fifty million dollars we'll you know we'll take these guys. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you look at what Pache and, and Shea Langoliers do is they strike out a lot. They don't walk a lot. They're kind of defense first prospects. That's not what the game is looking for. So it's not a great return uh, for Matt Olson. And yet it could be worth $50 million. And then you send out $50 million worth of guys. And you then you also pay Matt Olson $160 million uh, on, on his extension. Right. And then... What happens when somebody gets hurt and you can't turn to Christian Pache? <laughs> you know, you now know when tra- when tra- just Travis Darno gets hurt, you can't turn to Shea Langoliers. So well, it's like the kind of the opposite of the Tigers thing, where they yeah. they've emptied out the cupboard, and now you know who's who's left to come up through the ranks to supply you know the the injury replacement. So you, the the Braves may look better in projections today and be worse for it. I think Atlanta looks very similar on paper today as they did a year ago, right? Going into the World Series season and the fact that they won it in a year where Acuna got hurt still kind of stuns me because they were more of a a wild card, like middling high 80s win sort of team in the second half, but they played really well at just the right time and everything fell into place. I think the trade they made to get Matt Olson 
since they gave him the extension is very easy to justify. The return seemed light. I think part of the problem with these teardowns we're seeing in Oakland and now in Cincinnati is that everybody in the room knows those teams want to shed payroll. When everybody at the table knows what you want to do, you're not going to be as effective. I think Atlanta was able to deal from depth. They've got Drew Waters. Whether you like Drew Waters or not, he is a borderline major league ready center fielder. So they still have that guy available to shuttle between the big leagues and triple a. They have William Contreras, another good young catcher who might not be as good as Langoliers, but he's good enough if they lose Darno to be the other half of your catching tandem with Manny Pena. So I think they caught the exact right team at the right time with the right things they were looking for. And, you know, we'll see what Matt Olson goes on to do over the course of this extension. It's really kind of a a sad thing to see Freddie Freeman move on because it just feels like if you give Olsen that extension, yes, you are saving money per year. And I'm sure with the way Liberty Media wants to run the team, that's great. Great for the bottom line. Does it not at all matter that Freddie's been there the entire time and you could have had him for three or four years maybe at a higher AAV than Olsen and not giving up those players and then giving up those players for something else? More starting pitching depth or... Uh, some other upgrade for the roster. I mean, I, I'm not saying Olsen's a bad upgrade. I just think it's an interesting choice to make when you could have brought back Freddie Freeman and then gone out and got something else with the players that you dealt, assuming that there was another team interested in that combination of players. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. And also, what are you going to do with the 10 to $15 million you, per year maybe that you're saving? Are you going to, is that going to be, is that going to be the difference maker on your team? Right. Well, they did add Colin McHugh. They brought back Eddie Rosario. So they started to to patch up a few other to holes spend, in the roster. Spend that money. <laughs> Don't know if that's necessarily yeah. a net spend above where they were before, though. I think that's just kind of getting back to the team they had a year ago. Well, here's the thing I, I want to know. is like I want to know, what was the last deal to Freddie that they gave him, right? Like, what was the breaking point where he's like, I'll take a hometown discount, but not this deep? Like, like what is it? Because it does take two parties. And I'm surprised that he didn't bend at the end because – He's been there forever and his market now that the Yankees went and got Anthony Rizzo is basically, we think what, just the Dodgers. I mean, the Padres, Padres and apparently Dodgers. Are, and the Padres, Padres have are kind of in, but they have to, so, they have to get rid of Hosmer first. I think it's a lot of disrespect the for the Rays. Such, yeah. The Padres are in such an interesting situation though. I talked to a couple people there today and you know, they lose out on Suzuki who goes to Chicago. They badly need a bat, but they can't dump Eric Hosmer's contract. And it almost feels like they're having trouble getting people to come there. And so I wonder if you'd have to overpay. You certainly have to at least match and probably go over what the Dodgers are offering because he's from that area. So um, how can you do that with the Hosmer deal on there, right? Like they thought they had Suzuki. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday that was like, we are on the first and five going toward the goal with Suzuki. They thought they had he was Suzuki He was working out in San Diego. Until the Cubs came and swooped in and outbid them. So San Diego's kind of in a weird spot here where like they need a bat. And I don't see like a clear path for them to get one of those bats. But but so who was on your list of biggest improvers then, Derek? My list, I had the Twins, the Mariners, the Tigers, who Britt already mentioned, the Rangers, who did all their stuff pre-lockout mostly. Like They're mm-hmm. a lot better. Are they a playoff team? Eh, probably not. But I would say compared to where they were a year ago, they have made massive strides. And the Mets, people say we don't like the Mets on this show. The Mets are better now than they were when the offseason started, right? The Scherzer edition, we talked about that at the time, is huge for them. It gives them, I think, so much more of a a soft landing if something happens injury-wise to Jacob deGrom, a luxury they simply did not have last year. Both those guys are healthy. Look out. They already added Chris Bassett. You look at the depth they have with their group of position players. I thought in the Bassett trade, they had to give up some of that position player depth. Nope, Dominic Smith's still there. Jeff McNeil's still there. So this is a team that now has what looks more like Dodger sort of depth. If someone gets hurt or if a couple guys get hurt, the lineup doesn't get messed up that bad. The bullpen's getting deeper. They added Adam Adovino this week. So I just I really like what they're doing as the team that is aggressively spending right now and you know, creating their own tax levels in the new CBA as a result. Yeah. Who said we didn't like the Mets? I feel like we've given that we gave the Mets some definitely their props earlier on this winter when they were making all those moves. We mocked I'm them a, constantly. I mean, they deserved a lot of they the do. mockery that they oh, had in, in the in fully. the pre Buck Show Walter era. But I feel like they're they're trending in the right direction here. I feel like they're a team that's not gonna lose winnable games, right? I think 
we overlook the manager role so much in today's uh, game, but I think there are still managers left who make a difference. And AJ Hinch is certainly one because they didn't, the Tigers didn't lose winnable games last year. They won games. They won a lot of games on the basis. Uh, they, they really had, uh, they did the fundamentals locked in and you're going to see that I think with the Mets too. Um, and that's a Buck Showalter thing. And so I think that uh, the Mets are going to be, you know, Atlanta obviously is the team to beat because they're coming off of the world series, but if DeGrom stays healthy um, and I don't know how it's modeled out, you know, you would know like how, how much the projections like that, but if DeGrom stays healthy, I mean, they're just a really good team. They're a really solid team, especially in that rotation, which was kind of, iffy a little bit behind Scherzer and DeGrom and then you go and you add Bassett and all of a sudden you're like okay this 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 is a good this is a good looking team this is a good looking roster with an owner who doesn't care about the luxury tax thresholds if they need a player in July they're getting a player in July I think we all can agree that that if they're close Steve Cohen wants to win and they're going to go all in which really is unfortunate that we're talking about that like a yay anomaly but Mm -hmm. it's what it is the best rotations, according to Fangraph's war, are the Yankees first, the Brewers second, which I think is slightly more believable. But um, you know, the Yankees do have some interesting depth behind Cole. Uh, the White Sox third, and the Mets fourth, uh, and I believe maybe the Dodgers fifth. So that's uh, the Dodgers or the Phillies. Wow, that's very strange. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's the that's the top five, uh, and then the overall uh, best teams by by WAR right now um, are the Yankees, Dodgers, Astros, Blue Jays, White Sox, and Mets. And the Blue Jays are the only team that I haven't heard anybody talk about so far that I just think deserve some love for what they did, adding Matt Chapman uh, as their third baseman closed up their final positional hole. The one weird thing about that team is they're super right-handed. Kevin Biggio is their only left-hander offensively. But I've had uh, you know scouts and evaluators tell me that if you're a right-hander coming up, you have to hit right-handers. If you can't hit right-handers, you're you know the the, the short side platoon is not something that you get groomed for. You know, it's not something you get to the major leagues on. It's not good. It's no. not good. So, you know, maybe they just have a bunch of right-handers who've proven they can hit right-handers. I mean, that's, I mean, George Springer, you're going to be upset that George Springer's a right-hander, <laughs> you know, like yeah. he's a, he, you want him on your team. So I don't know if they maybe get a platoon uh, lefty uh, to, 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 to fit somewhere, but I think that is a very complete team. I love that team. I don't even love the Kevin Gossman signing that much, but Barrios, Gossman, Manoa, you know, you've got some, you've got some upside. You've got some veteran stability in the rotation, the bullpen, you know, maybe it has to get a little lucky. Maybe you have to get a little bit of health from Merriweather, but uh, it's a, it's a really good team. And I think they, uh, kind of a uh, a dark horse to maybe even win the division. Yeah, I think by projection now, the Jays actually lead the AL East in projected wins, only by about a half win over the Yankees. I do think the recurring theme with the Yankees and projections is something that needs to be driven home again. We have some people that didn't hear us say this a couple months back, <laughs> but because they have an older core, an older core is going to project really well, they have a group of players that because of their added health risk from their age are more likely to underperform lofty projections. They're a good team. They're a very good team. They have expectations that are kind of in their own stratosphere. And I feel like that pressure is intensifying while the Mets get to this new level of spending where they're the team in New York that goes out and gets everybody. It makes Yankees fans feel left out, which well, imagine how Mets fans felt for like the last 40 years. Maybe, maybe it's just a, just a fair uh, turnabout is fair play sort of thing. All this is to say, the Jays might not be done. The Jays could still upgrade that second base spot, too. Yeah. I, I like what the, the, they've, they've taken this young core. They've added via trade. They've added via free agency. They're not clinging to their prospects. They are going all in for this multi-year window. And they didn't stop with the success they had last year. They've already made that extra move for Chapman. I think that makes them better because I think Chapman's going to bounce back at the very least. He's a great defender at third base with power, but I think he can get back to the levels we saw in 2019 as a hitter as well, which could make him sort of a down ballot MVP candidate. Maybe someone who gets overshadowed by the other two MVP candidates on his own team. So all in on the Jays and and their improvements. What's wild to me is the Jays and Rays might be in a class of their own in the AL East. It might be 
1A and 1B before you get to the Red Sox and Yankees. All four of those teams are very good, but two of those teams might actually be legitimately better than the other two. Agreed. And you wonder with the expanded playoffs this year, like how many teams come out of a division like the AL East, right? Um, how much does that help some of these teams? And we talked about the Central and how they're kind of all competing, but they're, it pales in comparison when you line those rosters up with those four teams you just mentioned, right? It's it's crazy to think about. Like four, It's basically four teams and the Orioles who mm-hmm. like, who basically their one good hope of like news and Adley Rushman now is – you know, he's going to be hurt to start the season. He's got triceps and then it was a forearm thing. I don't know about you guys. That always makes me think about Tommy John when I hear tricep and then I hear forearm. Mm. You're in that general area. You start to worry about that. Uh, I'm not saying that's what it is, but I think it's probably going to be longer than like the two to three weeks that they initially had, had kind of come out there today and said, uh, that's not something you want to mess with. Right. Because that does lead to a lot of injuries down the road. The, the new playoff format is going to make the AL East uh, really interesting because the top two, um, the top two division winners with the best record get a buy, you know, and so there's going to be this like race for the division. Nobody wants to come out of the wild card in that division, and then you know, what if it's Rays, you know, Rays Blue Jays for for you know to get to to advance? They'd be so annoyed, you know. Everybody's gonna like every game is gonna count to the very end um, in that division. They're gonna try and win that division. Um, so I, I find it uh, I find it fascinating. I, you know, the Rays are actually a dark horse for Freddie Freeman. That's the only other team that we've heard uh, associated with Freddie Freeman. And if they did that, um, I don't know. I think I'd have to kind of consider them. <laughs> like it could actually switch the division for me, you know? uh, putting Freeman on the Rays. It would be, it'd just be an amazing idea. So um, you know, there's a couple things out there that can still switch some stuff up. There's one guy, breaking news. There's one guy who won't be around to change anybody's fortunes. The Rockies have signed Chris O'Brien for $180 million, which is Ooh. hilarious because they're still paying for the last third baseman. They paid a lot of money. To do. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Robert Murray has this tweet out there. The Rockies traded Nolan Arenado and $51 million to the Cardinals only to go out and sign Chris Bryant for $182 million a year later. This is the worst franchise in baseball. Like, <laughs> and I say this, I say this at a time while the Reds and A's strip it down to the studs on their roster. The A's especially. The Reds still have some talent left, and they're they're kind of doing the half rebuild thing. The A's are doing the full demolition. Home Alone to Uncle Rob's apartment in New York, where Kevin's throwing the paint cans and doing all of the stuff in the all of it. All all the renovation is happening in Oakland. But why? Why are the Rockies adding Chris Bryant? It doesn't do anything. On the one hand, yeah, cool, great. Teams are spending on players and Chris Bryant's getting paid. On the other hand, they will not go to the playoffs in any year with Chris Bryant on that contract. They're not going. Even with expanded the, playoffs, they will not go. On the other hand, why would Chris Bryant want to go there? They already this won a World also- Series. Get paid. No, yeah, this this to me is also on Chris Bryant. Like I, I guess. But like, really? You just want to go to Colorado and be dealing with a downtrodden franchise, probably get traded, be miserable. Like why, why over a couple extra million dollars? So that he can be traded away from the Rockies with money. <laughs> like there was nobody else in on Chris Bryant. Of course there was like, I don't know. It, it also takes two to tango. It's, it's flummoxing that the Rockies, well, the Rockies did need a bat and they did a bat that they thought could hit well at course field. Uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of get it from that perspective, but I'm sorry. I got to put a lot on the player here too. Like, you chose to go to Colorado and you're going to hold a press conference and say about how good you feel about this organization. Like, how can you even with a straight face say anything nice about where this organization is headed? Nothing. There's just, there's no reason. Oh, I got to go. one thing I can say. It's nice. <laughs> nice it's place nice to live. that they're trying to compete, but they're not. There's more playoff teams this year. They're not like they, this makes oh, yeah. it look, look like they're, they're trying, trying to compete. They said they just signed Chris Bryant. Outside of that, you know, what have they done? You have to do it's other like, things. <laughs> it's not enough. This is enough. basketball. I'm, you can't sign I'm one trying. player and win. I'm trying. <laughs> I, would, I would respect Chris Bryant if his presser consists of him being like, yeah, I already won, like you guys said. I just wanted to go with the highest bidder. Okay. I mean, that's probably I would, the truth. I would respect that. I would I respect that. What, what else is there that. to it? 
did he was he convinced by some amazing PowerPoint presentation in in the Colorado front office? Like, yeah, actually, I, I believe in the vision here. No, did he not get on the phone and talk to Trevor Story or Nolan Arenado anyone. or anyone who's played there recently and have them say, "Yeah, Denver's a nice place to live, but this is a this is a strange, strange organization right now." That's the whole Hampton thing, yeah, good right? Schools. They got good schools. the uh, The projected <laughs> win total for the Rockies before this move was sixty five point four. Four wins behind the Diamondbacks. Maybe they're tied with the Diamondbacks now to be 15 games behind the Giants, who are projected third <laughs> in the NL West. Like you this, know, this only makes sense if they're going to go out and sign like four more players, the next four know, best remaining free agents. That's the only way this makes sense. Do you know what the other Rockies news was today? Uh, they, they updated the schedule. Uh, and so there's all these weird things like the Rangers have to go from Anaheim to Miami for one game and then to New York or something, um, where over oh, two for a double header, you know, on what used to be an off day. So there's going to be some weird, gross things in the schedule this year. Um, one of the weird ones is that the Rockies end the season with six straight against the Dodgers. <laughs> It'll be a bye week for the Dodgers. <laughs> Seriously. Six straight. Such a weird thing. Oh, my Twitter's not updating, so I'm probably missing other moves. But like today's been a really big move day, I feel like. A lot of guys off the board. Um, Schwarber, Suzuki. A lot, you're starting to see like some of the Yeah, how about the players. Phillies as a dark horse for biggest improvers? I mean, they add a big bat, they add a closer. You True. know, they they added they added a couple relievers actually trying to to help around there. Um, I guess the only thing with the Phillies that's just really rough is their center field situation and and really their shortstop situation unless Bryson Stott comes up and and hits really well. I mean, they're they're kind of good everywhere but up the middle, which is like, you know, a lot of teams are like, you know, we want to be good up the middle is our is our first philosophy. They're like, hey, we got Matt Beerling and Odebel Herrera and Didi Gregorius, the oldest shortstop in baseball. Yeah, I, I think Stock could end up being the starter and Didi could be kind of a, a backup at third and short if Alec Bohm can bounce back from a disappointing or 2021. The DH and... I, I like the Schwarber addition. I, I think Knable is better than Hector Neris. So I see that. They got a little more bullpen depth. I don't think we're real big fans of Brad Hand at this stage of his career. And Juris Familia could be, I don't know, exactly the type of gas can reliever that Phillies fans are all too familiar with, but they have a good rotation. They should score runs. They've improved upon a lineup that was already good last year, at least projected to be good last year. A healthier Reese Hoskins with Schwarber gives them a ton of power. And, and JT Real Muto and played hurt for a stretch of last year too, right? It's that a, thumb injury. It's still a bad team defensively though. And they were a bad team defensively and they are going to be again. Yes, yeah, Schwarber certainly doesn't help that. But he yeah, does exactly. <laughs> He does give them what they wanted, which is a power bat, a guy who's capable of playing left field. And someone who had playoff experience, which is mm-hmm. interesting. It's like, okay, now they want playoff experience. Like, are they, is that going to help them get to the play? Maybe. Um, they're an interesting team, though. You look, I still put them behind the Mets and the Braves in the division. Um, I do think they've improved, but I don't think they've kept pace enough with those teams. I think the best um, they can do is clamor over one of, if the Mets and Braves sort of fall apart, I, d- I doubt they would beat both of them, but like maybe the, one of the Mets or Braves just have a bad season when it comes to health or something like that. And yeah. Phillies end up second in the division, get a wild card and, you know, maybe they can get hot in the postseason. Yeah. I think the Phillies are, are good enough to go to the playoffs. So I think for them to even get marginally better, it makes sense with where they're at, with their cores at having Harper, still in the middle part of his peak years or maybe later part of his peak. He's going to play forever and be good for a long time. So it, it makes sense for them to be spending right now. If they went out and they were, if they were the team that got Trevor story and say, Hey, they solved a problem. They, they added more. I don't think they will do that, but I don't think they'd be unjustified because the expanded playoff field, it suits a team like that really well. Uh, even a team like the giants, if you're projecting them to take a step back, they have a much better chance of going back to the postseason with the expanded playoffs. I think the Angels on the AL side, they make a lot more sense as a team that could keep pouring in resources for now. The Mariners, who I mentioned, is one of the teams that have improved a lot. That that Mariners red tra- Reds trade, I understand maybe trading Eugenio Suarez if you're the Reds because you had Mike Moustakis and you probably never should have signed Moustakis in the first place because the pieces didn't fit. So I can understand if they had just traded Eugenio Suarez to Seattle. I don't understand why they felt like 
they had to also move Jesse Winker as part of the deal because the Reds, to me, are more in that Phillies, Angels sort of better than average team, had some prospects coming. Like It, it feels like the the impatient fantasy player in a keeper or dynasty league who, who thinks that they have to tear it down sooner than they need to. Like, no, you, you had a window. You had a chance. And with all the news that's come out from the Cardinals with Jack Flaherty's shoulder getting checked out, with Alex Reyes having some shoulder issues, that doesn't look like a division race that's that's unwinnable if you're even an 85 win team. And I think the Reds were that, and now they're they're taking a pretty big step back. It's a it's it's a weird thing. So you know, you you thought that some people actually told me that they thought that the CBA had addressed tanking. I think I've, I've seen tweets like this. It didn't. At least it hasn't in the first week of its existence. <laughs> like, it never it never will until there's a floor right there has I to be that, some I kind think of that's mandate. the thing because they did there were so there is a draft lottery now however you know getting let's so let's say you lose the draft lottery and you get a fifth pick instead of the first pick the fifth pick is still worth a lot of money that's that's what's going on it's like you're still tanking to get this asset you know this young player under team control blah 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 and you still get it you don't get as good as one but you still get it so it doesn't change the actual math that people do when they say you know we should actually we're not good enough so let's be bad for a while and get some high picks doesn't change that and then uh you know as as you said in the in the pre the proof is in the pudding (laughs) the a's are not usually a full teardown team the a's are usually a team that buys and sells at the same time what do we see in this offseason looks more like a full teardown this looks more like a cubs astros tear it down to the nuts and bolts like i almost fully expect sean murphy to 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 be traded now because who's left you know there's there's rumors about romo loriano who has four years i think of team control left and it's like this these aren't t- these aren't players that the a's would have traded in the past and they're also i think getting even worse returns than they used to get in the past you know related to what dvr said about you know, if everyone's tanking or if everyone's trying to sell, then you're just not going to get as good return. I mean, I think the best prospect the the A's got back in all their deals is Kevin Smith, who had like a, you know, 29 percent strikeout way in triple A last year and may or may not be able to, you know, to make that power work in the major leagues with with a good strikeout rate. Yeah, it, it I, I've heard like people. Um, agents like make the case that salary floors don't really fix tanking because teams can still be really bad. Like the Orioles and sign two veterans to whatever contracts and still not try to win. Take on an Eric Cosmer or whatever. Yeah. I get, I get that part of it, but I also think that what's going on right now should just not be allowed. Like you look at Cincinnati and like a week ago I had to do like a one question for every team. And my question for the Reds was like, who are they? What are they doing? It's very clear now what they're doing a week later. Um, but again, what are you selling to this fan base? Um, why did you have to do this? They could have been an okay team. They could have even been a competitive team, as you guys said, with a few additions. So um, what is the point of this? It, really? Like, it, it, is, it is not – it's something they tried to get rid of that I don't think you're ever really going to be able to get rid of as long as the incentives are there. You need to penalize losing, and they haven't done that. It's just not it's not growing the game when you have teams that make make it clear to their fan base in March that they have no intention of competing for a playoff spot this season. Oakland has done that. Cincinnati, I could still even with the bad trades, at least the bad short term trades, maybe long term, they got enough value back in the return. But I could still look at that team and say, oh, they're they're not that bad. You know, you could just go kind of spot by spot. Jonathan India was a nice breakout last year. Joey Votto's renaissance was fun to watch. Tyler Stevenson's at least a good young catcher. I could see a Mike Moustakis bounce back. A healthy Nick Senzel is interesting, right? They lost Nick Castellanos in free agency. They weren't going to bring him back. The glaring hole in left field's a problem now. Like, sure, Jake Fraley is a fun power speed guy to play as a fourth outfielder. He shouldn't be a starter if you're going to go to the playoffs. That seems like a stretch. They still have Castillo. They still have Molly. They traded for Mike Miner for some reason. They flipped Amir Garrett on Wednesday. That was kind of surprising. They have young pitching, Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo. Reaver San Martin is interesting. So it's just not that hard to look at this roster and still see some good on it. And then you say, well, they would have been better if they still had Gray and Suarez and Winker, especially Winker. I, I think that was the piece that just kind of made my head explode. I'm like, why? 
why did you have to trade him to everything else? I feel I feel like you could almost justify you could justify Gray because you had pitching depth, other teams don't, and you wanted to find a way to upgrade your offense, maybe replace Castellanos via trade. Okay, I could have got on board with that, but this sort of maneuvering does not compute for me. Yeah, the uh, the, the the weird thing for me, I mean, the, I think the reason is like you know salary, but it's weird. You know that their uh, CB tax luxury uh, tax payroll right now is one hundred and seventeen million, according to roster resource. It's higher than I would have guessed, but the key is next year it's fifty eight million. So they they what they did was they needed they felt like they needed to get rid of those years two and three of the of the Suarez deal. What they got less for. Uh, Winker by attaching Suarez to him, and it, you know I feel like. Do you remember there was a there was like a Rockies quote where they said like we're going to be more like the Rays? Yeah, I mean everyone wants to be like the Rays, but that takes some actual work and people behind the scenes. You know, well I think they all things. learned the wrong lessons from the Rays. They're like, oh, <laughs> oh, the Rays trade away young players, so we can do it too. Uh, the Rays have success with one-year players, so we can do it too. So we're going to trade away Suarez and Winker and sign Donovan Solano for four million dollars, and we'll be just as good. Or, or there's a there's a famous tweet out there about, uh, you know, the, about Billy Bean makes a million moves, uh, and his team is a little bit worse but a lot cheaper. Yep, that's, <laughs> that's kind of been the story of what he's done in Oakland the entire time he's been there, and and had success along the way because for a, a long time at the beginning of his tenure there, the A's were finding the undervalued resource that actually made an impact. Now, I think you could go back and make an argument and say, well, the speed and defense and things that they're going after in these trades, maybe they're doing that again in their own way. And we could all sit here and, and debate whether or not it's going to work. I just think they're they're missing the plot. Like they They were not... They were not bad enough to tear it down, and they didn't have to tear it down. Both of these teams, Cincinnati and Oakland, could have started the season, seen how it played out until July 15th. If they felt like they weren't where they needed to be to make the playoffs, even with the expanded field, they could have made the trades then. Because in the Reds' case, Eugenio Suarez could have had an extension of what was happening in September, right? If he puts together three or four good months, you're getting more to trade for him. Or you're not taking less for Winker because you included Suarez and his salary in the deal. Winker could have had that healthy MVP caliber season in that park in that lineup. He could have increased his own value. So I just think Sonny Gray got traded for an 18 year old that was just picked in the last draft. Now you might like that 18 year old. You might think he's very good, but you don't think he could be traded for another 18 year old at the trade deadline. (laughs) I just, yeah, I I feel like you'd, you'd still have interested buyers for all of those players four months from now. Yeah, it's uh, it's bizarre, and you can see it a little bit in what the, the 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 Cubs are doing. So their Cubs are trying to come back, right? They're trying to start adding, right? They spent some money, and it's I think it's good that they went out and got Marcus Stroman, and it's and it's good that they went out and got Seiya Suzuki. I you know I wrote uh, today in the roundtable, Seiya Suzuki. One one exec told me that he thought that might be the best deal of the offseason. Uh, because they got him for five years and seventy million, and he's a guy who's hitting thirty-eight homers with almost as many walks as strikeouts in 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 Japan. So you know if that power translates, yeah, you are then it is a pretty good deal. Uh, he's also twenty-seven years old and uh, and and like an asset on the base pass and, the, and defensively. So you know maybe that's a good deal. However, what you see is that same sort of deal is like we're not going to go for the top guys and and spend lots of years and they're probably I doubt they get Correa you know and instead we're going to get Anderson Simmons for four million for one year we're going to get say a Suzuki because we think he can be a bargain we're not going to buy at the top of the pitching market either we're Stroman we think he'll be a bargain oh it's he's fewer and everyone's doing this the Giants have so much money the Giants have so much money in the first big deal that Farhan Zaidi does in San Francisco. Two years to Carlos Rodon. Which a GM complained about to John Heyman. Do you see that tweet? Like, oh, when with Rodon getting that kind of money, it's going to be really hard for, for little GM, oh, the little guys to compete. Any and little every, team could have done that. Every team, every single team in the, the league could have given that contract. That. The Red, he got maybe the Rays would have. For it. Yeah. Like, what GM calls themselves the little guys, first off? These are <laughs> billion-dollar franchises. I'm, I'm, again, like I think they'd have to – penalize losing i think even the salary floor like you mentioned with the reds the reds would still be this year well within that right i think you have to penalize losing or it doesn't go away 
There's some perennial losing needs to be. Yeah, floor or, or penalizing losing. They're just the the thing that ownership has never wanted to do is connect winning or losing with any sort of penalties. You know, like they 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 just they just don't want. They want that they want cost certainty, right? They're business people. They want cost certainty. They right. want that's why they want you know, all the TV money and all that stuff to basically pay for all the players so that, you know, anything that comes after that is gravy. So, you know, they don't want, they don't want to get penalized too much for losing. They don't want to, you know, so, you know, they share, they share postseason money, stuff like that. Uh, they don't just like give, you know, the champion most of the money, you know, it's yes, they get bigger shares, but they share all the postseason money. Um, uh, the, the other thing is, there are always like unintended consequences with these CBA changes that are kind of hard to 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 realize in the in the in the present tense. So, for example, there's a, there was a small change that I wrote about about how you can't option a player uh, five times more than five times anymore. And um, you know, I think to the players that sounds like oh man, that is a really rough situation. You know, guys like uh, you know Maza and uh, Lewis Head in in Tampa Bay got optioned ten times or whatever. Those guys, that's that's a terrible year, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, to have to move ten times, to have to like you know get up and go down to Sacramento or wherever it is, Nashville, and then come back and go back and like that's awful. So for them, quality of life increases. However, the, the, so then the second order effect is these teams like the Giants, Dodgers, Astros, and Rays that managed to get basically more active roster spots by doing this, right? They're going to have to change their their business a little bit. They're going to have to do things a little bit differently. Then the third question is, how are they going to act differently? What are they going to do now that they can't option their young guys 10 times? Um, and I think the answer might be more phantom IL slots. So if you look at even what the uh, what the Giants did this offseason, they re-signed all their old pitchers. Old pitchers are like the easiest guys to put on the IL because <laughs> like, oh, Anthony DeScafani's finger hurts. Oh, yeah, totally. I believe you, you know, like, oh, Alex Wood's back hurts. Yeah, of course, Alex Wood's back hurts. You know, you got Carlos Martinez and Jacob Junis in there. Now you can just always have three guys on the IL and you'll just have basically an eight man pitching staff with, where three guys are on the IL at every time, you know, and yeah. that'll be just like the new, you know, the new option a guy 10 times. Uh, I guess the benefit of that is if you're on the Major League IL, you get paid. You get paid major league money. So yeah, you're not going what? back and forth to the the AAA affiliate a dozen right. times, which would be yeah. rough. I mean, I think the Giants are among the teams that are are leaning into injury risk with pitching and finding value as a result. I mean, even Logan Webb, who's not a free agent signing, but just a guy that's missed some time and that is essentially their number one. He has elevated risk. Rodon has elevated risk. Alex Wood certainly has elevated risk. Alex Cobb has elevated risk. Desclafani of those four, at least, is probably the safest of the bunch. But when you go after a bunch of guys like that, part of keeping them healthy for a full season is knowing that they might need rest, not causing injuries by overuse. And that can sort of help you justify that IL stint that, that you know is talking about. What, what makes it even more, I think, probably doable, you know, is the fact that they changed the IL stint from the 15 to 10 days again. Although I think um, it's still 15 for pitchers or something. No, they they well they changed it down to 10 this year. Hmm. Aren't they changing it back down to 10? I think it's 10 for hitters and 15 for pitchers. Really? I thought that Dave Dombrowski probably because said, like, because it's easier to put a pitcher on the because you can phantom <laughs> DL guys. Yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, but they're still you can still phantom DL position players when you need roster spots too, like back injuries and things like that. Um, oh yeah, you, totally. And the Giants might and, do that because they have old, old position players, and that's what—that's why they had so many optional guys last year because Vossler kept coming up every time Longoria was hurt or Tyra Strato when Brandon Crawford needed a blow. You also don't have to go one for one. You can you can bring up a pitcher and IL a hitter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So and go I don't know why they wouldn't just. Bit. Yeah, like teams can. That's a huge loophole. I don't know why teams just didn't make it ten all around or fifteen all around because. Changing it by position just gives front offices even more chances to like mess with the rules and play with the loopholes. And and I do think that like that was the one thing that was like you know holding people back from signing people right away is I think every front office pulled an all nighter after the CBA was agreed to and read it all night and then had a meeting in the morning saying, okay, what loopholes do you see? 
<laughs> like how can yeah. we extract, how can we uh, take advantage of this? So, you know, I, some of these things won't be obvious uh, right away, but I would, I guarantee you three years from now, we'll look back on the CBA and be, oh man, this one thing that we didn't expect, you know, just started blew up and I, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it is, uh, you know, one or two year deals for old uh, position players that, um, you know, you can just IL when, when, uh, you know, when you don't need them. Had a question related to one of the changes. Of course, we have the universal DH now. And uh, there was a piece that Jason Stark wrote a while back. And he mentioned that the most recent big league seasons have had on average about 20,000 fewer balls put in play than seasons of about 20 years ago. And the question is, does having 20,000 fewer opportunities to convert a batted ball into an out matter mean that defense matters more? or less than it used to. So I'm just kind of curious what you think about a, a, a bigger picture change because universal DH sort of connects this too. Mm-hmm. There's some debate about how much that impacts the game, being able to take your worst defender off the field and to put on, you know, a fourth outfielder who maybe isn't as good of a hitter, but is a much better defender. What kind of impact that could ultimately have on roster construction and, and just how the game is played. So I think that the way the to- game has changed like those defensive first guys no longer on rosters right like if you remember even when I got into the sport like 10 15 years ago there was still those bench players who were light light hitting but were used in their defensive roles and that has kind of gone away from a lot of teams um some clubs still have one but by and large clubs would prefer the slugger who is an absolute butcher uh, because they feel like he's going to impact the game more than the guy who hits a buck 90 uh, but can play a really great shortstop, a really great second base. Um, I think the game has changed. And because you're rewarding the hitting, because hitting has gotten paid, um, you've kind of changed the players who come up and how guys approach. You know, guys who maybe were defensive-minded know that they're never getting past AAA or, you know, at best, that bench spot if they can't hit. So I think the game has changed. I think I still think certain clubs place more emphasis on defense than others. If you have a a young pitching staff, like you have to be able to catch and throw the ball, or you're just going to ruin the development of that pitching staff. You're going to ruin the confidence of that pitching staff. Um, Defense still has the ability to win games. Um, So I think that it is overlooked a little bit more. I wish it wasn't because I personally love watching great defensive plays. I think it's just as exciting, if not more so exciting than a big hit. It's certainly more exciting than a home run um, because we've seen so many of those now that the excitement level for me isn't there. But watching a guy make an unbelievable defensive play, um, I always prefer that. But, you know, I'm, maybe I'm in the minority when it comes to how we watch baseball. I'm certainly uh, not saying that you get paid more as a defensive player because you don't, which is the reason why guys have changed their swings to hit home runs because home runs get guys paid. And home, you can't defend a home run, right? No. Um, no, I think I think you're I think you're right. What I'm hearing is like it, it, there's like two things going on, which is the market is not valuing def- defense as much, which means there might be a little bit of a chance to get defense at an undervalued rate. Like maybe that's a little bit what's going on in Oakland, where now you know they probably have plus defenders or all across the field. Once they bring Nick Dow- Allen up at shortstop, they can have a plus defender at every position probably. You know, Kevin Smith is a former shortstop, Pache in center, he might not be great offensively, but defensively he is. And so you start to see oh maybe they maybe they were doing something there. If you look at the major league leaders in uh in defense, you'll see the Cardinals um and uh uh, I think the Royals are usually a, a good team defensively. So those are teams that you, you might think of, right? When you think of defense first. Uh, but the Astros were third in, in defensive run saves last year. And, you know, anytime you see a team that's supposedly like super progressive and, and, and you know, spending a lot of money on R&D, anytime you see a team like that uh, in the top three on a, on a certain stat, you have to think, well, maybe the – Maybe the Astros, you know, see the defense is underrated. It's a little bit like strikeout rate. You can fill your team with a bunch of sluggers that don't make contact, but your team will be better if they can slug and make contact. <laughs> so you can fill your team with a bunch of uh, guys that can't play defense like the Phillies, but your team will be better if they can play defense and play offense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it kind of makes you wonder for a team like the Phillies, are they wasting a very good rotation or making a very good rotation 
less impactful by putting that defense together behind that staff. Yeah, I mean, Nola has Nola has like the best strikeout minus walk totals uh, every year and doesn't have the best ERA, and that's it's a weird discrepancy. And part of that's got to be the defense behind. Yeah, it's hard to see an ace that can throw to a two thirty seven ERA one year and then come back with a four sixty three just three years later with better skills. Like the underlying skills now for Aaron Nola are better than they were when he posted the elite of the elite ratios that he had now four years ago. Uh, it's defense is important, but the game is not like also, you know, that's why we were talking about widening the field, you know, to like, you know, emphasize defense. Like if there are fewer balls in play and we have a DH in every league, then I, I just feel like, the and and then we're also optimizing for the home run and the strikeout. So these are things like if you gave me a board game and I was playing with my kids and you would hear the rules, I would like look at these rules and I'd say, oh well, obviously the best thing my hitter can do is hit a home run, and obviously the best thing my pitcher can do is get a strikeout. And so I'm going to optimize. My pitchers are going to optimize for strikeouts. My hitters are going to optimize for homers. And none of these things have anything to do with defense. <laughs> You know, <laughs> like so, our t our the way the game is is optimizing is optimizing away from defense, and that's why you have twenty thousand fewer balls in play. That's why defense matters less. Um, that's why you have some teams that are going for it. I think the Mets um, and the Phillies in the past have kind of decided they're going to put out subpar. Like think of Mets center fielders. You know, it's been a bunch of guys that are okay corner outfielders that they just put into center, yeah, and even putting Starling Marte out there now. They're putting an old version of Starling Marte out there that won't be a gold glove caliber defender. Like that's he's, he's 33 now. He's not that type of player at this stage of his career, even if he's better than what they have been using at the position. Yeah, I think I think Sandy Allerson teams uh, you know, are betting that defense doesn't matter as much. Uh seems like maybe Dombrowski teams are a little bit like that. Yeah. Last question before we go. Do you have a favorite move? Um, this is inspired by Zach Grinke's reunion with the Royals that we learned about on Wednesday. Do you have a move that either a trade or a free agent signing that you said, this is this is what I want. This is exactly what I wanted to see. Um, selfishly, hmm. Nelson Cruz in D.C. because it means I get to talk to him a lot. He's like one of my <laughs> favorite players, baseball minds to talk to. Um, just someone who's universally liked. Somebody who... Uh, has been around the game for a while. So it has nothing to do with what he's going to do for the Nats. Though I do think what the Nats are doing is a good idea um, in getting these aging veterans. And if they're not any good as a team, they can sell them off at the deadline, but they're helping these young guys along. Uh, but just selfishly, um, Nelson Cruz, I was I was happy with. Baseball-wise, was there a move that I'm, I really wanted to see happen? Chris Bryant to the Rockies, obviously. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, good for Chris that's my Bryant. cynical answer. Uh, that's my cynical yeah. joke answer. <laughs> if, my if head, he's happy, I'm that's so great confused. for him. <laughs> I'm so confused. Why, Chris Bryant? Why? I, I I had to be the best offer. Most most money, most years. That's that's the only that's the only answer. It's it's, it's not the proximity to Las Vegas. Like you're talking mm -hmm. about people that make so much money that a plane ride's a plane ride. It does not matter. Like it. Vegas actually isn't that close to Denver either for people who've actually looked at a map or, you know, measured. I, uh, I, I like Sonny Gray to, to the twins. I thought that was a good deal for the twins. They needed pitching and Sonny Gray has a great curveball. It's going to play well. And he obviously played well in reds. It's a tough park. And, uh, and I, I like Sonny Gray too. So I'll, I'll probably see more of him, uh, you know, coming through town with the twins um, and I just think uh, I think that was a great move. They they needed to have pitching. I don't know. It, he's very comparable, actually, to Jose Barrios. So, you know, it's it's like a cheaper. You know, it's a little bit like the moving the deck chairs around and like, uh, you know, oh, we yeah. got this prospect for that. And this pro and then we we and like, we ended up with a slightly worse version of Jose Barrios. Right. We didn't go seven years on Barrios, <laughs> but we've got two years of Sonny Gray instead, and we were going to lose and, and, Barrios. And an extra this prospect year, so, for it. <laughs> yeah. Like just a, a lot of extra work for a very similar outcome. But I, I was glad to see him go to a place that's not Great American Ballpark anymore for his home park. So that'll bring the home run rate down. Uh, my move that I, I thought, aside from Grinky going back to the Royals, which is just kind of cool. 
Gary Sanchez going to the Twins also. Basically, Gary Sanchez just not being a Yankee anymore because I think we lose sight of what he does well because of all how much about the spotlight is on his flaws. I want to see what he hated him. see. What is, yeah, what is he going to do without constant scorn? Like I think he's going to hit. He's going to hit a lot. And maybe it's a low average, you know, 230 sort of, of ceiling in that category. But maybe it's 30-plus homers this year. I, I think that's well within reach for him. So uh, I want to see if Gary Sanchez can sort of bring back the Bomba squad in Minnesota in 2022. That's a good one. There's actually been a lot of good. Scherzer to the Mets was a really good move, I thought. Javi Baez getting out of New York, I think, might be really good for Javi Baez. I think he may. You know, he's a guy who strikes out a lot. He's a guy who, you know, really has those ups and downs. But um, he doesn't have to be the guy in Detroit. They have Cabrera. Um, you know, Scherzer I think Scherzer to Grom, dude. Whew. Yeah. Just a dominant one, too. I mean, two of the top five pitchers in the game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Seeger awesome. to Tex- Texas, like making some big moves is also great to see. You know, there's been, there's been some really good moves, I think. You could make uh, can't big wait moves for the they're... first time. You just have to do more. So if the Rockies do more, I will retract my laughing at them for adding Chris Bryant. I promise. <laughs> the move I want to see, the, the thing that we've seen tossed out there as a possibility, Freddie Freeman to the Rays. Please. Yes, I would love that. The Yankees bring back Anthony great. Rizzo and the Rays go get Freddie Freeman. Like that would... Oh my goodness! It would it would hurt Yankee fans to their core to see the disparity between those two players if the Rays actually made that splash. Agreed. Uh, I did write an interesting piece before the beginning of 2021 that might be relevant to the Rangers, and it was relevant to the Padres. Ended up being a little bit prescient actually for the Padres. The title of the piece is "Can a Team Win the Post the Win the Off Season?" And it was because the Padres had made all these moves, and we're all super excited about the Padres. Um, and I looked at the relationship between the number of players signed uh, from free agency and added via, via trade and how much that improved your win percentage. And it was uh, a, it was a mediocre return. Plenty of teams win the offseason and don't get anything for it. So that's something to keep in mind. I think it it's kind of obvious when you think of the Rangers is because they made a lot of moves. They probably, if you, if you wanted like anoint a winner of the off season, it's kind of the Rangers. I mean, they did, they put John Gray, Simeon yeah. Seager, like they put a lot of good players on that team and they're still only probably. Okay. They're, yeah. But they're getting there. They're getting there. If they yeah. had gotten Clayton Kershaw who opted to go to the Dodgers, we would feel a little better. I would have really liked to see Radon on that team. Yeah. Yeah. They still need, they need pitching. Uh, but you're right. The Mets seem to always win the off season too. Right. And like last year too. Yeah. And... <laughs> so we we'll have to look back on this conversation and see, see who's right. It's going to be me. It's going to be about the blue Jays. It's going to be the blue Jays. Nah, the Jays, <laughs> Jays are you, legit. You, you left them out of your little graph to start. You can't be on the blue Jays train now. No, they were on that graph, weren't they? Were they on the graph? I don't know. The You're graph. all in on the Yankees. You're, I don't know. Blue Jays. Okay. All right. Best graphic in streaming internet show history. It is just a spreadsheet blown up very big, and it makes my forehead look enormous. I think it's time for us to go. If you'd like to send us a question for a future episode, send it to the Rates and Barrels email address, ratesandbarrels at theathletic.com. On Twitter, Britt is at Britt underscore Giroli. Eno is at Eno Saris. I am at Derek Van Riper, and you can get a subscription to The Athletic for $1 a month for the first six months at theathletic.com slash baseball show. And on the 3-0 show, you've always got a green light.